Good morning. Uh, welcome to another lecture from uh, Big Data and the Semantic Web. Uh, we have talked uh, a lot already about how to prepare and publish linked data. Uh, we talked about RDF and all the vocabularies. We talked about Sparkle, the query language for uh, RDF. And uh, also in the tutorials, uh, we have already seen how to actually publish link data, how to link them. Uh, and in today's tutorial, we will um, we will try out uh, some Sparkle queries um, so that you'll know how to query the data once you have it. And uh, the topic of today's lecture is uh, actually uh, something from the other side of the spectrum, and that is how to uh, use link data, how to access link data from uh, from um, code. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what you can expect uh, from a typical uh, RDF uh, focused library that uh, you will find in uh, many of your favorite programming languages. Uh, there are some uh, better quality libraries, there are some worse quality uh, libraries. <clears throat> and uh, today I'm going to show you two of those li libraries for Java. Uh, but there are, of course, libraries for other programming languages as well. Uh, the point of today's lecture is to show you what you can find in those libraries that you can use. Um, because what happens quite often is that uh, something that is already implemented many times in such libraries the students try to implement by themselves again and again, and then, of course, they make many mistakes in the implementation, which are completely unnecessary because they are um, pre made and available open source libraries uh, free to use. So the point of today's lecture is to show you what functionality you can find in such libraries so that when you uh, gets to work with linked data on your own in your own applications you know what to expect and what you do not have to implement on your own uh, as i said i'll talk about two uh, of those libraries both in uh or for java uh, and both of them you may already uh, know because they are the frameworks on top of which they are the whole um rdf um, triple stores uh, implemented. So uh, RDF4J is one of the triple store implementations based on the Eclipse RDF4J framework. And uh, Apache Jena Fuseki is another implementation of a triple store built on Apache Jena framework. Both of those are frameworks for, uh, for Java. Uh, right. So today's lecture will be split into two parts. In the first part, I will talk about Eclipse RDF4J. And then in the second part, I will show you how the same thing can be implemented in a slightly different way for the same programming language uh, by uh, uh, basically competitive or uh, no, by a second framework for the same language, also focused on RDF, but a different framework. Um, there are, as I said, there are also uh, frameworks for other uh, libraries for JavaScript, Python, .NET, and so on. Um, also, building an application on top of filling data is part of your semester project assignment uh, from the next tutorial, not today's, but the next one. Um, and in the next tutorial, also, we'll try out these examples, um, or you will try them out on your own. Um, so. Uh, so that you can later build an application on top of your data. Uh, right, so let's start talking about Eclipse RDF4J. Uh, all of those frameworks and Eclipse RDF4J, each of those layers has a different res responsibility. Um, so the, the most basic layer is always the RDF model which corresponds to the specification, RDF, and it supports representing 
what is re representable in RDF as an object model in Java, which means that there are classes for IRIs, blank nodes, literals, then for the entire statement, and quite naturally for RDF datasets and RDF graphs. Um, in RDF4j, I already mentioned this when I gave you the overview of the triple stores, but in RDF4j, named graphs are named contexts for historical reasons, uh, but those are the same things. So that's the basic part, the RDF model. Once you know how to represent triples and uh, graphs in memory as, a, um, as an object model, you can add another layer on top of that and uh, have a repository, uh, which is responsible for que querying the model, um, for maybe updating the model, reading the model, and so on. And uh, with RDF, we also have the RDF syntaxes or serializations, which is how the RDF data model actually looks like when it's serialized in a text file, which is what is then transferred over the internet or saved somewhere on, on the disk. And that's another layer here, RDF IO, BO, and uh, this layer contains uh, writers and readers for the standard syntaxes of uh, RDF, such as intervals, NQAS, turtle, RDF XML, and so on. Um, from the image of the stack here, you can see that there are some other parts. So we have the RDF model on the bottom here. Then we have uh, Rio, and uh, then here there is something called a SAIL API. SAIL is a shortcut for storage and inference layer. So uh, this API is actually responsible for storing and re retrieving RDF data from the model and also for inference. Last time we talked about OWL, and I gave you the example of uh, what you can do with inference on top of a knowledge base. And before we talked to RDFS, where we had uh, subclasses and sub properties, and uh, also we talked about inference, how you can infer uh, some new triplets based on what you already have in your knowledge base. So that functionality is also implemented um, as part of the sale repository. Now, uh, when talking about a RDF repository, so something that uh, you can use to store RDF data and retrieve RDF data, maybe query RDF data. Uh, one thing is the sale repository, which means that uh, you have the RDF data model in your process. And uh, there is another option, and that is that uh, actually you are talking to a remote RDF repository, which can be represented as a remote Sparkle endpoint, for instance. But again, you can do the same operations with your in process repository and your remote. Uh, Sparkle endpoint repository, given that uh, it, is, it is an a Sparkle update repository. So that's why here we have this second part of the repository API, which is an HTTP repository. Uh, it stands for a remote Sparkle repository. So um, uh, in the layer of the repository API, you have the same methods for storage and retrieval of uh, statements and querying. And it is up to the implementation of that API, whether it is actually a in-process repository or, or a remote repository. The operations here are the same. And because you can query a remote repository, you are also able to actually create uh, a Sparkle endpoint from the stack, which um, is the HTTP server here. So this HTTP server is the same one as here, and you could have all the entire stack also also here and connect to it remotely. So those are the basic layers of, um, of the library. And now uh, we'll go a bit deeper and um, the rest of the lecture will be based on examples of code and uh, explanation of, of what the code actually does. So we'll start with the model, model API, which means uh, classes for IRIs, blank you know, literal statements, graphs, and the, mo the entire model, which corresponds to the RDF data set. Um, right, so the, the uh, basic or abstract uh, class here is value, which, which is abstract or uh, a superclass of every RDF term. 
Um, and uh, it doesn't matter whether the actual term is an IRI, a blank node, or a, a literal. Uh, all of those are instances of uh, value. Then, as we already know from RDF, those are the types of value that we can have. We can have a resource, which can be either an IRI or a blank node, or it can be a literal. So those are the RDF terms. And when we have three or four of those terms, we can create a statement, a triple or a quad in case of uh, um, named graphs. And the statement consists of, of a subject, a predicate, an object, and optionally the context, which is the named graph. So th these are the basics. Um, you will see later that with Apache Jenna, those are the same, even though they are named a bit different, but uh, the basics need to be the same because they are based on the same specification, which is RDF. Yeah. Right, so let's create some triples. Um, in uh, Java, there is this factory pattern uh, used in this, uh, in this library. So uh, first you need to get a factory and then based on this factory, you can create objects of the type IRI, literal, blank node and so on. So here we'll create an IRI for Bob we'll create an IRI for a predicate name, and we'll create a literal um, like this. So this is a simple string literal with the value Bob, and we'll put those three into a statement. So like this, we can create our first triple uh, saying that Bob has a name and uh, Bob's name. Now, um, since this library is actually uh, being used. There are some syntactic shortcuts um, and uh, some convenience classes, um, namely for uh, the most common vocabularies used in uh, the web of data. There are predefined um, well, classes with the predicates uh, as constants uh, and, and uh, you know, predicate IRIs and class IRIs from those vocabularies as constants. So for RDF, RDF is our uh, Dublin core for DCAT and so on. Um, you can, uh, you do not have to remember the IRI of a uh, certain class or predicate. You can just use the constant that is there for you. So here, Bob is a person. Uh, this statement can be created using those um, uh, constants that come with the library. Um, right, so now we know how to create individual statements. Put those statements into an RDF graph. So that RDF graph here is a model and we need to create a model. Now again, model is uh, an um, interface and it may have different implementations. Those implementations differ, for instance, in uh, indexes that they use uh, or data structures that they use to represent a set of statements. But uh, from the interface point of view, a model is nothing more than a set of statements. Uh, right, so there, uh, here we have two different implementations of the model interface, but uh, uh, those are implementation details, which are of no concern to us at this moment. So we'll create a model and into that model, we can add a statement. And we can do this for other statements as well. And what we get is a set of statements a model. Now, uh, there are methods that allow us to actually add triples in a more direct way. So we do not have to create uh, or create the statement and then add it to the model. We can add statements directly. So there are many ways of doing the same thing. Now, since a model is actually a set of triples, we can iterate over that set. Um, so uh, we can do a four cycle uh, iterating through all the triples in that model. Uh, there are some filtering techniques that can be used. So for instance, here we iterate the model for all statements that uh, subject is whatever, predicate is RDF type and object is fourth person. So like this, we are able to actually retrieve all uh, entities or all people uh, of a type for person without querying the, um, the model using Sparkle. Um, up to now, when we wanted to retrieve 
some data from an endpoint, you always use Sparkle to do that. Uh, but that's not the only way of retrieving uh, or working with RDF data. The other way is a simpler way, uh, taking advantage of the fact that an RDF graph is a set of statements and can be filtered as such. So when uh, you're accessing RDF data, you can either query using Sparkle or you can iterate through the statements and filter those triples. Um, so those are two basic types of actually accessing RDF data. Uh, right, and then on top, on top of the, uh, the methods that will allow you to get to subjects or objects of the statements that uh, you filter like this. So for instance, here, we iterate over, uh, over the model. Uh, we iterate again over the people uh, because subject can be anything. It has to be uh, a triple with uh, RDF type predicate and full person as an object. And then we can access the subjects of the filtered statements and actually get a set of uh, values. In this case, it's a set of uh, IRIs because um, or, or blank notes because those are the people. Uh, and then uh, we can also get to uh, gets to uh, the literal value of a, of a triple. So what actually is happening here is that uh, here in the four cycle, we get all the people, we get the subjects, which are the IRIs of the people. And then uh, we filter the same model with that person um, in each cycle. And we take a look at uh, their name and we access the object literal. So this cycle retrieves all names of people in the model without using Sparkle. Now, um, it would be quite messy to create RDF um, values, RDF statements in the way that I have shown you. Um, up to quite recently in RDF4j, that actually was the only way to do that. Um, in Apache Jena, uh, this way of actually creating the model was present a long time ago. And uh, recently it got into uh, RDF4j as well. So uh, you can use something called a model builder, which you can actually create like this. And uh, note that uh, this code actually resembles RDF turtle a little bit because it also forms kind of um, human readable paragraphs. And um, basically what you do is you create uh, prefixes in the builder, then you create a graph, and then you say, okay, now we talk about this subject, John here, this is an IRI using the namespace, which is another name for a prefix. Um, and then John has a name, John H42, and uh, mbox, mailbox, uh, johnexample.org. And uh, you can chain those, uh, those methods like this, forming something similar to, to RDF turtle. And um, of course, you can add a triple uh, uh, like this directly. And when you are done with building the model, then you just call build rebuild and you get the model. Um, this is the nicer way of actually creating. Right, so that was the model API. Now you know how you can create IRIs, blank notes, literals, statements, and in graphs and uh, uh, in, in different ways. So now let's try to query uh, the data that we already have. And for that, we have the repository API. So here uh, we'll, we'll have to create a new repository and initialize it. Uh, now note that here I show you how to create a uh, in-process repository. And uh, below we have um, the example of creating a remote Sparkle endpoint repository. Uh, both of those ways actually end with the initialization of the repository and then uh, the API is the same for both cases. So it doesn't really matter whether your repository is a remote one or a local one. Um, here, uh, the argument of the cell repository constructor is uh, again, uh, a specific implementation of the repository. 
Memory store is the one that stores all the RDF data in memory, which means that when you shut down your process and run it again, it will be empty again because it only stores the data in memory. Um, the advantage of a memory store is that, that it, it is fast because it doesn't work with uh, the um, storage system, basically. It just works with uh, memory. Um, alternative to this is uh, a native repository, which also has files on disk, and um, it may, uh, can be persistent. But also here, uh, you have variants of repositories, like a, a repository which supports inference, and uh, various kinds of inference. So here would be the place where you put an implementation of a repository that allows you to uh, do, so, uh, for instance, OWL or RDFS inference. Right, either way, you end up with uh, an object uh, repository. Now, in order to work with uh, the repository, you need to create a repository connection which represents the actual connection to that repository and you get it like this. So on the repository, you get the connection. Um, now this may generate uh, lots, uh, lots of different exceptions. Uh, so normally you would, uh, you would ha uh, have to handle them somehow, but uh, this is a construct from Java um, where you enclose this in a try block and uh, therefore, um, uh, also, the connection would need to be opened and then closed at the end. So this takes care of, uh, of some of uh, that boilerplate code for you. Uh, right, so now we have a connection to a certain repository. And since we have a connection, we may query the data. Now, I've already shown you that uh, you can actually get some of the data even without querying, just by filtering the, the model. But uh, since we already know Sparkle, we will want to uh, use Sparkle queries to get some uh, data from repositories. And there are three basic types of queries defined in Sparkle. Um, actually, when we talked about Sparkle, we talked about four kinds of queries. But here, they are grouped according to what kind of data they return. And therefore, there are only three because both construct and describe actually return RDF graphs. So that's a graph query. Uh, Sparkle select and tuples. So you can again imagine the results table of the select query. So that's a tuple query. And of course, there is a Sparkle ask, which is a Boolean query, which returns true or false. Uh, right, so let's, let's try to uh, query a Sparkle endpoint. Um, actually through a repository connection. So that may be a Sparkle endpoint, which is a remote one, or it actually can be uh, your RDF model in, in your process. So we will have to get the repository connection and we need the query that we want to ask. Here I ask for subjects and objects where, uh, of, of any triples in the repository. So it's a simple query. Um, first thing you need to do is uh, you need to prepare the query which will get you the tuple query uh, object. And it gets the, or it receives the query string as a parameter. So with this, you get the tuple query object. And on that object, you can call evaluate, which actually does the evaluation of the query and gives you the result. Since we are talking about a tuple query, it needs to be a spark of select query. And the result is uh, tuples, which means basically rows of a table, each row having columns. Um, so um, the, um, the result object here is uh, a table. And uh, therefore, we can iterate through the individual results. So we do that in a while cycle here. So while we have our next result, we get the next result. And uh, therefore, we get one row of the results table, which is called a binding set because each column of this row is a binding. So the set of uh, columns on this row is a binding set. So here in the binding set, we have the row and we can access the individual columns by get value and the name of that column. And therefore we get uh, the value of, uh, of the individual columns. So like this, we can actually ask a Spark or Select query and get results and, and process them and do something 
with them. Right, uh, there are also shorter ways of, uh, of doing this. Um, so here we actually first uh, created the connection, then we created the query, then we evaluated the query, and then we iterated through the results. Um, so this can be done in a shorter way, where we have the query string, and then we directly get a list of uh, binding sets, so list of rows, um, and uh, we do it like this with a lambda uh, function uh, in Java. Uh, who of you actually codes in Java? One, two, three, not so much. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you code Java, good for you. If you don't, you can see how it is done and um, yeah, what you can expect in your favorite uh, programming language. Uh, right, and then you get the bindings and you iterate through the bindings. There is yet another way of doing this, even shorter one. You have the query and uh, then you can chain those like uh, you prepare the query and you evaluate it and uh, as a parameter of the evaluate method you can actually uh, give it a writer which gets the result and does something with it and one implementation of that is spark of results csv writer which gets the results of a tuple query and creates a csv file out of that and uh, it, in this case, it writes it on, on console or on the default output. Um, so this is a very simple way of actually executing a query and writing out the results in uh, the CSV format. Right, the other kind of a query is a graph query. So this is for Sparkle construct or Sparkle describe when the query actually returns an RDF graph. So here we again prepare the query. Now it is construct SPO where SPO, which means give, give me all the triples in that, uh, in that repository. Uh, and we evaluate it. We have a graph result. And a graph result in this case is an RDF graph. So we are able to iterate through it and we get uh, a statement as uh, in each cycle. And we can do something with those statements. Uh, we can also um, get the results as a model and get the model and then do all the operations we are used to from the model API, such as filtering the results and so on. Uh, again, there is a shorter way of doing this using a Lambda function. Uh, right. Now, uh, we have queried the repository using Sparkle now. Uh, but it is not the only way. We have already talked about iterating through the model statement by statement, and we can do that also with a repository. So uh, like this, we, uh, we uh, can get a statement from a repository connection, and we can use the same filtering as we saw before with the model. So here we filter, uh, or we get all the triples about Alice, uh, and we can uh, do something with those triplets and then uh, then close the uh, the statements object here. Uh, and this is a shorter way of doing that. What is what it is showing you is that, uh, because a repository can also be a remote Sparkle endpoint repository, you can filter those statements even uh, with a remote repository. In that case, of course those calls get translated into Sparkle queries. Uh, but uh, if you are working with a local um, in-memory, for instance, repository, uh, this might be in some cases faster than actually evaluating some Sparkle queries. So this is why I am showing you these alternatives uh, because sometimes those are faster and actually lots of times those are all you need because quite typically you need to list all people and their names and so on. And for that, Sparkle might be too, uh, too complex in some cases. Uh, right, so uh, we have seen how to query data. Now we also need to talk about how to load data into a repository. So in this case, we'll have a file containing data in RDF XML, so one of those standard RDF serializations. Um, Whenever we are loading data from a file, 
we need to specify uh, the base URI in case that there are relative IRIs used in that file. Uh, because there is no other way of, uh, of actually getting uh, the base URI. So this is the default base URI for all the relative URIs, unless there is another base defined in that file. Right, so we have the, the file and we have the base URI. Uh, we get a connection on, on a repository and we can call an add method, uh, giving it the file, the base URI, and specifying the data format in which the file is serialized. Um, this actually loads the file into that, uh, into that repository. There is also another uh, way of doing that, and that is loading a file directly from a remote uh, URL or using a URL. So you can add um, everything that is in this file uh, into that repository. And again, you specify the URL, the base URI, which is the same URL in this case, and the data format. And then you close the connection. Uh, so this is how you can add triples into your repository. And this is how you can remove triples. Again, you can filter. So here we are removing all triples regarding Alice. Uh, from a given repository. And again, for remote repositories, this translates to Spark to update queries. Um, so yeah, this is an abstraction of, uh, of both of those approaches. Now, uh, yeah, uh, the, the final example of the repository API is uh, querying a, a remote Spark endpoint, which is the example that will uh, start with in our next tutorial. So not today's, but the next one. Uh, so here we again create a repository. This time it is a remote Spark line point repository. We initialize it. We get a query like this. So this queries for all instances of a void data set. So we are querying for data sets in that repository. We get a connection and uh, we prepare the tuple query. It's a select query, so a tuple query. Now one a bit weird thing here for you might be that we are actually specifying the query language here and we haven't talked about anything else than sparkle so far so it is a bit weird that uh, this needs to be specified here however this is for historical reasons because um, before sparkle 1.1 actually became a standard uh, there were many competing um, languages to do update queries uh, and one of those was Sparul, which was Sparkle Update Language, which is something different than Sparkle Update nowadays. And that is why for some uh, of the queries, you can actually specify the language you are using. But nowadays, it doesn't make any sense to use anything else than Sparkle. Uh, right, so we evaluate the query and we get uh, the results. The, the, there is another uh, way of actually getting the results using streams. Uh, so that's just for uh, Java enthusiasts. Uh, what we end up with is a list of bindings, so a table, and uh, we iterate through those bindings and get the values of S. This name of the column corresponds to the name in the select clause here. So we get the value of S, which is uh, the IRI of a void data set. And here we actually print it to a standard output, and that is it. So what this does is that it creates the remote endpoint and prints out all the uh, instances of IRIs of void uh, data sets. Right, so that's the repository API. So now we know how RDF is represented as an object model and how we can access and update the data through a repository API. The next layer is uh, Rio RDF input output. So so this one deals with actually serializing and deserializing RDF from and to text files. Um, so we'll start with an example where we get uh, a turtle file and we want to load it. So we have uh, the IRI of a turtle file. We open an input stream and we get a uh, turtle parser like this. Then uh, the parser will generate statements as it reads the file. So we need something to put the statements in, and that's a model. So we create a new model. And then we say that the parser uh, should have a handler, which is something receiving 
the statements coming from the parser and doing something with them. The something here is implement the, uh, is a statement collector, which takes the statements and puts it in a model, the one that we have just created. So like this, when a, a RDF statement comes out of the parser, it is saved in the model. And then we call RDF parse parse. We give it the input stream and the base URI again, because we are reading a file, we need to specify a base URI. And the parser then goes to the file, creates the statements, the statements get processed by the statement collector and saved in the model. There are again, uh, many different exceptions that might occur during parsing. Um, so those need to be handled somehow. There is a shorter way of doing that again. So we can have a model and uh, we use a helper method like this. And we say we are parse input stream, base URI and the data format, and we get the model. So it is actually, this is the shorter version of, of this, but uh, the individual steps are the same inside. Another example is actually writing a file. So we start with a, a, a model and uh, we'll have a file output stream. So we'll write into this file. For this, we need a writer. So something that actually takes RDF statements and uh, serializes them into um, a specific serialization. So we create a writer for RDF XML here and we point it to the output stream. Uh, and uh, we start RDF and then uh, we let the writer to handle individual statements from the model. And then we end the RDF output. Now, for some of the writers, the start RDF and end RDF actually does nothing. Uh, but uh, for the RDF XML output, it actually writes out the root RDF uh, element and this ends the root RDF element in the output XML. Uh, document. So for some serializations, this does nothing, but for some others, it may be, uh, it may be uh, significant. And again, there is a shorter way of doing this. You have a model, you have your file output stream, and you use the helper method, write this model into this output stream in this format. And there you have it. Right. And in this example, we'll connect those two. So we'll implement a simple uh, transformer from one RDF serialization to another. So here we'll have this document in turtle. We'll open an input stream from this, uh, from this file and uh, we'll create a turtle parser and we'll create an RDF XML writer. And we'll point that writer to uh, this RDF XML file that we'll create. And then we link those two together. So we'll say that the handler of the RDF parser, so the thing that processes statements coming from the parser is the RDF writer, which accepts the statements and writes them out in the selected serialization. And we start the parsing. And in the end, what we, uh, what we have is a transformation of uh, the turtle file into an RDF XML file. <laughs> Right, so that is what you can expect from a decent uh, RDF library. Um, I say this mainly because uh, in your uh, in your semester project, uh, it will be recommended to use one of those libraries uh, in creating your application. But if you have object objections to using Java, maybe uh, because you uh, don't code in Java, you may use uh, a library in a for a different programming language. However, it needs to be a decent library providing similar functionality uh, because what sometimes happens is that uh, the students uh, skip all the libraries and they just create a HTTP request with Spark endpoint and write out the text that comes out of it, skipping all the RDF processing stuff, which is not the point of uh, the semester project. So um, in the project, you will be required to use a RDF library the way it was supposed to be used. So typically query the endpoint using some classes provided for uh, this purpose, getting the model, iterating through the model and so on. 
Right. So now uh, we continue with Apache Jenna, but uh, the functionality will be not, there will be nothing new in the functionality. Um, this is just to show you how the same thing can be implemented in a different way. Um, so again, it is an RDF framework. It is written in Java. So it needs to have the same functionalities, but it is implemented in a little different way, uh, but not, not that much. So Apache Jenna here, uh, has again uh, an image of of the stack and in the core you have uh, the rdf api uh, which implements again the the rdf model on top of that you have ontology api which corresponds to the inference api in rdf4j so this one actually implements the inference um, capabilities uh, also on top of that you have a sparkle api which allows you to query the rdf api using sparkle uh, now, completely aside is the HTTP server called Fuseki. You know this one, right? So Fuseki is an HTTP server which inside has this, this stack and allows you to actually uh, receive queries over HTTP and execute them over the uh, model that it has inside. Um, right. So let's get to it. So again, we'll start with a model. Which means that we need objects, uh, we need classes for IRIs, blank notes, literal statements, graphs, and models. Uh, and here, every RDF term is a, a uh, instance of RDF node. So in Eclipse RDF4j, this is value. Here it is RDF node. And there are two kinds resources and literals. Now, resources can be IRIs and blank nodes, and uh, literals are literals. And then, of course, there is a statement, which is a triple uh, of, of RDF nodes. We'll start building our, our model. So we'll have a URI and a name of, uh, of, some, uh, of some person, and we'll create a model. So, th so far, it is quite similar. So we'll create a model. We'll create a resource uh, based on the URI of on John Smith here. And we'll add a property to that resource. So this is actually similar to the Eclipse RDF4J model builder approach. So on that resource that we created based on the URI, we add a property full name and the value that we had. Uh, now, now also we'll again have a URI, a given, given name, family name, full name. We'll create a default model and then uh, with uh, the resource John Smith here, we'll create the resource based on the URI. We'll add the property like here, but then we'll continue. We'll add uh, a, a recard uh, name, which is actually a blank node. So the value here is not a string, it is another resource, but this time is created without a URI. So the result is a blank node. And on that blank node, we create the given and family name properties. So again, you can see that this forms sort of a paragraph of data similar to turtle and um, similar to the model builder approach. Right, so that's, uh, that's uh, individual statements. Now uh, in the model, we can, uh, we can again iterate. So for that, uh, we'll get uh, an iterator and using that iterator, uh, we'll again get the next statement. From the statement, we can get the subject, the predicate, and the object, and uh, we can print those out. So uh, that's uh, that's actually nothing nothing new. So this is just to show you how you can access the individual parts of a statement. Uh, there is a way, a little bit different way uh, of filtering those statements in the model. So here. Uh, we'll create an iterator and we'll give it, um, uh, we'll give the method list statements a selector, which is an object, but it works in the way that we are used to, uh, that is quite intuitive, because now means that here you can have anything the pre uh, for the subjects, for the predicate, it's a uh, recard full name, and for the objects, it can again be, uh, be anything. And uh, then this method gives you uh, uh, actually, this is even more complex. 
I, uh, now I, uh, I can see because here we actually create this uh, selector, but we also, um, yeah, we also give it uh, a uh, select method override. Um, and we give our own condition on which of those nodes get selected. So here yeah, we select uh, all those uh, full names, uh, but uh, actually then we filter those only to those that end with, uh, where, where, the, uh, where the values end with Smith. So here get string gets us the literal, uh, which is the object of this statement. And we um, see whether it ends with Smith. And if it ends with Smith, then the select method here returns true. And therefore, this statement is returned by the iterator. So like this, we can create our own iterator filtering Smith people. Right. Uh, a small example showing how to work with literals. So here, uh, we actually add properties. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, we have a resource here. Uh, it is blank node because we don't provide any URI. So we have a blank node and we add RDFS label to the blank node. And here uh, we um, create this string with the English language tag. Then we add another property with uh, the same string in French. And then, and this is a little specific to uh, Apache Jena, um, we create an um, XML literal. So this true here actually means that the literal is an XML literal, uh, which is one of the special um, data types of literals, uh, meaning that the inside is an XML document. Uh, it is not used that much, uh, but it is good to know that there is a possibility like this to actually store um, XML uh, values in literals. And then we write out the model uh, into a standard output. Right, so again, we can serialize and deserialize the model. So uh, we can uh, call model write and uh, say uh, where the model should be written out and in which serialization. Uh, the, same, uh, the same almost goes for reading. So again, we can read a model from an input stream when we give it a serialization uh, and so on. So this functionality is very similar to what is already in Eclipse RDF4J. So we can move on to querying. And again, we all query using Sparkle. So in Jenna, uh, there are actually four types of queries according to the four types of queries in uh, Sparkle. And um, uh, yeah, we actually create a query and then uh, we need to cre uh, create a query execution uh, from that query, which represents the one execution of the query. So we'll have a query object representing basically the string of the query, and then we'll have a query execution representing one execution of the query, because one query can be, of course, executed many times. So uh, there is a distinction here. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get the query solution out of that, uh, and uh, it, will, uh, it will contain a result set, uh, which, can, which we can then uh, format. So let's get to it, uh, a sample uh, select query. So we'll have a model, we'll have a query. It doesn't matter what the query is. It's a Sparkle query as a string. And we create the query um, object out of that string. Now, based on this query and the model, uh, we create the query execution. So the query execution object actually knows which model is to be queried by which query. And then, on that query execution, we uh, call the exec uh, select method. Um, we get results and we can iterate through the results. Uh, we, from the results, we get the next solution again. And a solution is one line of the uh, solutions table. And uh, so on that solution, we call the get method with the column name and we get the value in that column and we can do something with it. And finally, we close the execution. So like this, we can execute a Spark select query uh, using Apache and Jenna. Now with construct, describe and ask, it is similar. So just quickly, 
uh, we create the query effect, uh, we create the query and the execution. That's the same for all of those. The only uh, difference is that we uh, that there are actually specific uh, execution methods because they return uh, different results. So exec construct uh, returns a model because those are RDF triples. Exec describe also returns a model, and exec ask returns a boolean uh, boolean result. So like this, uh, you can query uh, using Sparkle. Now, uh, in Jenna, there is a special support for data sets, which are the RDF data sets, which means one default graph and a set of named graphs. So here, um, we can say that uh, this file actually contains a default graph, uh, and those files contain named graphs. And uh, uh, yeah, OK, so we, are, uh, we all have a list of named graphs. Yeah. Uh, from the so here we have uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah so we have a string containing uh, uh, default graph file URI so this is a URI to a file which contains data to be loaded into a default graph and this list contains uh, files uh, for individual named graphs and um, yeah uh, the data set factory here takes the IRI to the default graph and the list of IRIs to the individual name graphs and allow, um, allow us to load it as a data set and then execute the query on top of the data set. So like this, you can actually create a in-memory RDF data set consisting of a default graph and a set of named graphs where you can actually load those data from the individual graphs. And again, the same uh, example that uh, we are going to try out on the next tutorial, um, this time in, uh, in Jenna. So we will query a remote Sparkle endpoint. Here, we create the query uh, representation of this. Again, we query four instances of white data set. Uh, we create the query execution. Uh, and this time, uh, the query execution will actually uh, be created as uh, a service request, the service is the Sparkle endpoint. Um, so we give it not uh, the model, but the URL of a Sparkle endpoint and the query. Using that, we get the query execution object, which is then behaving the same way as it was before. So we exec uh, execute the select uh, query and get the result. We iterate through the results, we get a solution which is one row of the solutions table and we get uh, the value of the s columns uh, column in that uh, in that row and here we print it out to uh, some object response which uh, i will get to uh, in the tutorial we'll create something called a servlet which actually sends uh, uh, creates an http server and uh, this is the object in which you uh, write the http response uh, but you'll see that in the in the tutorial. Uh, finally, uh, you close the uh, query execution, and that is it. So, yeah, this was quite quick today, but this is all for today. Uh, I've shown you how you can use or what you can expect from a decent RDF library. Uh, I've shown you two of those libraries in uh, Apache Jena, uh, in Java. One of those was Apache Java, one of those was Eclipse rdf uh, You are free to experiment with those. And um, yeah, as uh, you can actually already see on the web, I think the assignment from the next tutorial will be to create an application using one of those or some uh, other library, um, querying your data that you are working with throughout the semester. Uh, and uh, showing a, or creating a simple application on top of the data, showing something. But that's for the next tutorial. In today's tutorial, we'll talk about Sparkle and we'll try some Sparkle queries uh, on the endpoint. Any questions? If not, this is all for today. Uh, so see you in the evening uh, in the tutorial. <laughs>